Welcome to the Digital Dentures with Three Shape Dental System. It's being presented by Brandon Smith, CDT Academy Trainer at Three Shape. And I'd like to recognize one of our panelists this evening. It is Dennis Urban, CDT. He is our director director of clinical education, and I'll be posting up his email and phone number in case you have any further questions, concerns, or just merely want some tips and tricks. And now I get to turn it over to Kelly Bevington, the director of iOS technology here. Take it away, Kelly. Thanks so much, Jessica. Appreciate that. Uh, excited about this evening. I, I'd like to welcome Brandon to our, our webinar family. And Brandon has a unique perspective on things, being a certified dental technician, spending approximately 10 years uh, in dental lab technology, then working for Whitmix, who's a manufacturer of many laboratory uh, items and technologies that we use all the time, and then shifting to 3Shape where he has been an academy trainer for approximately two years. Uh, he's going to work on um, a, a dentures this evening, and we look forward to learning all there is to know, Brandon. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, sharing my screen. So I'm going to start off with a brief presentation that walks us through the scanning process. Um, so this is with the TRIOS. This can be done with the TRIOS uh, 3 or 4. Um, and the case that I went ahead and did is, a, is what I call a reference denture. So it's basically taking a denture that the patient is already wearing and um, basically doing a wash impression inside of it and then um, scanning that you can also take a bite in between the dentures and you can scan all that. You don't have to scan that in the patient's mouth. You can scan it in hand and then taking that into our dental system software and designing a denture around it. So um, the way that this works is first in your trio software, you'll set up a case and you'll select the full denture indication. This is really important because it gives you the proper workflows to scan these. Our denture indications are a little different as far as uh, the scanning process and the, the actual options that you're given to do these uh, scans. So these are the options that you're given. So you can actually scan a patient intraorally. You can scan an impression. So impression would be impression trays. It would also be when you're scanning a wash impression inside of a denture. And then you have the ability to also scan dentures. That would be more for like a copy denture. So if you're going to duplicate a denture, um, you would use that option. So I have a brief video here that kind of goes over this, the live scanning process. Um, and basically, he, uh, we got these from uh, Eric Kukuchka, who is one of our KOLs. So he's basically taking this wash impression denture and he's following the scan strategy here. So this will show kind of a back and forth between him scanning the denture and what's happening in the software. So the first scan path that he goes through, he goes around the ridge internally on the denture. Then he goes and scans the palette all the way across. Then he's gonna roll up on the border and scan the borders. And typically once he does that, he stops the scan and he'll let it post process. This is really important because it gives the scan its initial shape. Um, if you try to roll over the border to get the teeth area and the tissue uh, before you let it post process, you can have some distortions in the scans. So we go ahead and let it post process and then we start back on the, the border area and roll over to the uh, outer surface, the buckle. And then we pick up that last bit of information. So now we're capturing the outer border. And then we'll roll down and we'll capture the tooth material and the tissue material outside of that. And then the last step that we'll do once we get around the whole buccal surface is we'll jump up on the occlusal surface and the incisal edges of the teeth and capture those. The reason that we do this is it captures not just the impression itself in the denture, but it gives us the shape and size of the original teeth of the denture. 
Typically when patients wear these dentures, these existing dentures for a long period of the time, they like the size of the teeth. They typically like the shape of the teeth, but they're probably typically overworn. So they need new teeth. They need to reestablish their vertical. So this process really helps us. and gives us an accurate way to do this um, without having to create bite rims. Um, it cuts down the appointment amount. You can typically do these with a patient who has existing dentures in two to three appointments. So if you need to do a try-in of the new denture, you can do a try-in um, directly from this scan. Um, it's also an advantage because when you take an impression inside the denture, you can actually cut the borders down a little bit and you can get a border molded impression as well, which is really important. You can have them do their sounds and their lip movements and tongue movements and everything from this impression. So the try-in should fit really, really well. And then you're just checking the vertical dimensions and the aesthetics of the new denture at that point. If everything's good there, then you can go into the uh, final denture. So I won't play this video because it's very similar to the last one, but this just shows you on the right hand side, the scanning strategy for the lower. So the first step you're going to do is you're going to scan the bridge again. Um, I like to rock around as I'm scanning inside the denture because the space is so narrow there. If you rock, you'll be able to get into any of the undercuts in the ridge and pick that information up. Then you'll roll to the uh, border um, on the lingual, get the whole border there. Then you'll roll over to the buckle border, get that border, and then you'll go ahead and stop the scanner again, let that post process. Once it post processes, then you'll roll again to the outside, follow the same technique. You'll get the buckle surface, and then you'll also get the occlusion of the teeth. The last step is the bite scan. So because you do have teeth information on these reference dentures, there's no need to do a bite rim scan or a centric tray scan. You can actually just do buckle bite shots of the dentures themselves. So you'll have, you'll put the dentures back in the mouth now that they have the nice wash impressions in them so they fit really well. You'll be able to take just a regular blue bite um, of the patient in between if they need to open the vertical. And then you'll scan that blue bite in between the dentures and that gives you your new vertical dimensions. So this is, this is kind of what this looks like here. So you can see the bite material in between the dentures. You can scan this in the patient's mouth or you can take the dentures out with the bite material in between and scan without that. One of the main differences here between um, traditionally taking bites with our system versus doing these bites um, is with the second bite, you actually take a full arch bite all the way around. Um, the first bite is still a quadrant, which you can see here. The second bite will be, you'll start on the one side, and then you'll just keep coming all the way around. And that's really important for our design software. Um, our design software does require a full arch bite to, uh, to set the occlusal plane, which is really important to start placing the teeth and everything like that. So now in the video, they're taking bite number two and you'll see that they're gonna go all the way around. So here they are coming around the anterior. And you can see this is the live uh, feed from the software showing what, they, what was done here. And there they went all the way around. The bite aligned perfectly there. Um, and now the case would be sent over to our dental system software for design. So that's, that's really it on the scanning portion. So now I'm gonna go into a, a actual case I have here. Um, so this case is a uh, reference denture case. So typically on the first steps when we do these cases, um, actually my order doesn't seem to be filled out properly. Let me fix this real quick. So you always wanna make sure when you're designing um, these kinds of cases from an intraoral scan, that you have the case set up as a digital impression case. Um, if you do not, the scans won't be handled correctly. 
and you'll have issues with those scans uh, in the case when you go to go through the design. And that has a lot to do with the very first step in the design. The first step is what we call the prepare step. So what this does is it takes things like this. So these are our reference dentures that we scan um, and it actually allows us to uh, turn these into models. So it, it'll allow us to refine the scans. And so what refining does is it looks at the scans and finds any issues with it. So this one has a mesh artifact here behind the lingual of this tooth on the denture. So I can go ahead and select all and refine it. Now, I always want to make sure that before I move forward out of this step, I check off the impression box. That tells the software that this is an impression of a denture or a, an impression tray. So it knows when it gets to the sculpt steps later on in the prepare step that it needs to invert the negative into a positive and create the models for us. So all I need to do here is just go ahead and check that and then I can select next. And then it'll take me to the lower scan where I do the same thing. Um, always making sure that you refine the scans is really important because if there are any issues with the scan quality, um, you'll have a lot of difficulty later on in the design. So here's our lower, and I'll go ahead and refine the scans on it as well. So I'm going to select all, select impression, and refine this one as well. This one didn't initially show any artifacts, but it's still always a really good idea to go ahead and refine it, um, as it can have um, still some issues. It also does smooth up some of the borders and help with the quality of the scan and the edges so that trimming is a little bit easier. Next, we have our occlusal alignment here. Uh, so what I typically do is I'll turn off the lower, roll this around to the uh, occlusal view of the upper, and then I'll come over and hit set with points on the left here. This way I can go ahead and set my points on the occlusion. This will typically align the plane on the right path for me. And then I can take a look at it and make sure that that is actually on the, the plane there. I can turn back on the lower and just make sure and make any adjustments I need to. Then from here, I'll go next. And now I can trim my uh, denture down into an actual model. So when you do this, you want to make sure that you capture that full peripheral roll. So usually I try to go about right here, usually about three to four millimeters above the bottom edge of the impression there. That way I get that whole peripheral roll and I have more information here for me to design the denture and set the base outline and everything like that. So I'm gonna go come up and around. A lot of times in the, uh, the back end here of the denture, you don't have as much space to work with. So you just have to do the best you can here. Um, Typically, when we scan our dentures for reference dentures, we don't fill in the palette, so there is a hard edge there. You'll see once I do my outline here, it turns the area that it's going to keep green as part of the model. So this looks pretty good. So I'm going to go next, and I'm going to do the same thing to my lower.
So you can see if I turn my upper scan back on, it's now what looks like a model. It's based um, and everything, so it's ready to go for design. I just now have to do my lower. Let me go ahead and start trimming again, doing the same technique here, staying outside, trying to stay three to four millimeters away from the border. And then again, it highlights green, what it's going to keep. If I have any weird areas like this, I can fix those by adding another point. And that usually drops it right back onto the scan there, which is what I want to see. And then I'll go ahead and go next again. And then this, these last two steps, um, these will be now turned into model scans. And now I can go ahead and um, if there was any air bubbles or anything like that in the impression material, um, I can fix those on the models now. So here's my upper scan. Um, you'll see that it's in the color of the impression material. I can turn that off with the uh, option on the toolbar on the right. So now I can clearly see what the the quality of the impression looks like. I can then go in here with my smoothing tool and smooth off any any little areas that I I see that are bubbles or pools. All those can be fixed. And as long as I'm not overly aggressive with the smoothing tool, this shouldn't affect the fit quality of the denture at all. If I wanted to, I could also come in here now and carve in a post dam um, with the subtract tool. So if I wanted to come back in here, I turn the glossiness off a little bit there. You can see where I'm starting to build a little channel back here. And this is up to you if you want to do this. You don't have to do this. Um, typically, uh, digital dentures fit a little bit better than traditional dentures. Um, there's no acrylic shrinkage or anything like that with those. So you don't always have to do this. It's it's more of a um, you know a, a situational thing with you know based on the patient's anatomy and also what your results are. So. Um, definitely uh, see, you know, you don't have to do a deep one, you could do like a mild one. Sometimes you don't even have to do them at all. You just don't want to, you want to make sure that you don't generate too much suction to where the patient can't get the denture off. So what I recommend is if, if you're just getting into digital dentures and you want to try this out, maybe do one with the, the post dam in here and then one without it and see which one is uh, better as far as fit and uh, suction and everything like that goes. Then I'll go next and go to the lower here. Uh, typically don't need to do anything on the lowers unless I see some pools or bubbles or things like that. I'm gonna leave this one alone though and go next. And then this will take us into our, uh, the beginnings of our design stages. I'm going to go ahead and check and see if there's any questions, which I don't see in the, well, maybe there are. No questions at the moment, so I'm going to keep going. So this step here is for your 
um, occlusal alignment. So you want to take this and you want to place it right on the back uh, last molar there, then right in between the centrals, and then on the other last molar back there. That's going to give you your occlusal plane here. And typically what I will do is I'll turn off my opposing, my lower, so I can see down through here. And then I'm just going to take this and align it to the centrals on the bite. And then I'll just kind of look and make sure that the plane aligns with the occlusal planes of the upper and lowers. This is really important in this step uh, because this is going to define out how the denture teeth come into the software. So if you don't have this set properly, then your denture teeth won't show up properly in the software. You can also look at your uh, dentures without the bite in between and just make sure that everything looks set up properly. Um, the only thing I would caution against is if you're opening vertical dimensions, that you kind of balance this out in between the dentures um, where there's open space in there. Because if you don't do this properly, then your, your plane of occlusion won't be set up properly on the uh, denture design portion. From here, I'll go next. And then it takes us into the characteristic points. So, um, you'll see the listing on the left here, and I just have to follow through those. So I'm going to do tuberosity number one, incisive papilla, tuberosity number two. And then I'm just going to go here, and I'm going to look at the second uh, rugae here. And I'm just going to come slightly to the distal of it and place my point. Same thing on the other side, slightly to the distal of this one, and place my point. And then you can you can actually throw a grid on here, and you can check to see if they're proportionally correct. Um, you know, however you want to do that, there is a grid option over on the right. Then I'll go over here and I'll place my first retromolar pad. You want this to be a straight line across, and then you're going to do your center ridge point. and then your second retromolar pad. Now, you can see that this one is twisted. Um, so if I were to set my points way over here, where it should be, this is gonna generate Pound's triangle and it's gonna place that center ridge along where the blue, the darker blue line, or the darker blue point connects to the green point. So you'll see that it's gonna place my center ridge right here, which we don't want. So we're going to kind of cheat with this one. I'm going to move these out here so that the center ridge is more in the right position, um, just so that the teeth come in correctly and I don't have to do as much adjusting there. Then I'm going to place my canine points again here and here. And then you can see now I've got all of my characteristic points selected, so I'm going to go next. And then this will take me into my uh, upper jaw boundary. So this is going to generate a base plate for me. So what I'll do is I'll select my outline here. And then I can go ahead and start tracing out my um, outline. If I turn on the shiny uh, texture here, if I'm trying to place my outline in the deepest part of the sulcus here, I can see where the shine is just outside where my deepest spot is. So if I just follow along this, I typically get my outline in the right spot. And you can come up over your uh, frame in there and just keep going. And then as I move my view around, you can see the shiny uh, comes back. And then again, I can, I can go over these tendons here and continue around following kind of that deepest portion of the uh, sulcus here. I'm just going to keep going around. Brandon, I'm going to jump in. We do have a question sure. um, that's been posted. They asked, do you design your model with pins to stabilize VDO so occlusion can be verified after dentures are milled? Um, no, that's what the try ins for. So you'll, uh, you'll do, you'll typically print out the monoblock output first so that you can try that in for the patient. Um, and if the vertical dimensions are off 
there, then what you would do is just take a new bite. Um, and if the uh, fit is off, then you would take a wash impression inside the try indentures. Thank you. And we've got another one. Uh, with digital dentures, an indentulous patient that has never had dentures, we would have to do occlusal rim to get VDO and midline and canine and smile line first, right? Or you cannot do the digital dentures in this case, correct? No. So with a patient who's a dentulous, has no dentures, nothing pre-existing, um, you could um, actually use, there's a device from Iva Clark called the Centric Tray. Um, you could take your vertical dimensions in that. And then you could use custom trays or a direct intraoral scan to capture the upper and lower arches. That will allow you to align them in the software and get the proper video there. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So some other features that you have in this stage, if you're really curious to see what your, where you're at actually on the surface, um, of the model here. I can right click and show my local cross section. And then I can left click and grab these points and now you can see that I can see the profile of the scan and where that point is along that profile. So if I'm trying to get it into the deepest portion of the sulcus, I can find it with the local cross section here. So if I need to come back a little bit here to get it into the deepest area, I can do that. And you can go all the way around and check that um, with this tool turned on. So I'll move forward here and go to the next, um, and I'll go ahead and outline my lower. A little error here. You'll notice that if you get errors, a lot of times the software will tell you where those errors are. So mine showed me with a large red dot that I had an issue over here. Most likely there, that's an artifact on the scan that's causing that. So if I just back my border away a little bit, it should uh, allow me to move forward with it. And here it takes me to the lower. So the upper border came out just fine once I moved it. And now I'm going to go ahead and mark my lower border here. And that will generate my pink wax there. Uh, so that signifies the base plate. Then I can go next. And it's going to take me to my block out step. So with the block out step, um, there is an automatic block out that you can do, which um, based on the survey that the software does automatically, it, it will tell you where these undercuts are on the cast or on your scan and you'll be able to automatically block out or you can manually block out. I prefer to manually block out. Um, sometimes the auto block out does a little bit too much. Now for something like this, I wouldn't actually block this out. So I can select none over here on the left in the settings and it won't block any of this uh, small undercut here in the ridge. You can see that yellow has a value of zero to one millimeter. And this undercut is not deep at all. So I feel comfortable moving forward without that. 
Um, however, on the, the next scan, the lower, uh, due to the way that the retromolar pad on the patient's uh, left is twisted, I would want to go ahead and block that area out underneath it. Um, so if I, I automatically block that out, it will do a kind of an extreme block out, which I can show you here. It basically takes wherever the path of insertion is set and it blocks it straight down on any area that has color. So you'll see that a lot of these yellow areas get this automatic block out here all the way around. And that can affect things like your borders, if your border outline goes way out here. Um, so I don't like to do this. I like to do my own block out here mainly. So I'll select none again. And I'll go to the wax trimming step here where I can add some block out back there. So I'll go in here, I'll turn my intensity up or my circle size up and I'll make my intensity kind of low. And I'll just come in here and I'll manually add some block out. Now I can limit the amount of block out that I add with this slider down here at the bottom of this left area. Um, whatever the value in the box is, is what it limits me to. If I set this at zero, it does not limit me. So I can add as much block out as I want. So I just went in there and blocked it out. I do want to be careful though, because I don't want to block out anything down here where the border should go. So I'm going to remove all that here. And then I'm going to move forward. So I've severely reduced that undercut that I had there in that retro color pad area. Once I go next, it takes me to the smile composer step where I can go ahead and choose my tooth selection that I want to use. So first I would drop down the provider box and any tooth libraries I have downloaded will show and this darker blackish text, the ones that I don't have downloaded will show gray. So I'm just going to grab a library of teeth and place these up in my main screen here. So, um, I can choose from multiple different libraries. I have currently the Finars downloaded. Um, so I can choose from the Finars. I have the uh, Ivoclar Viva Dent Teeth select in here. So I can choose a lot of different libraries. Um, and then once I've chosen one that I like, if I hit the apply button, it will populate up on the main screen. And then I can see what it looks like in relationship to the arch forms and see if this is a library that I, I feel like I can use. So I popped up this library on here and it looks fairly close size wise. Um, if I feel like that's maybe too big, I can go to a different one. So if I try this one out, I can just hit select it and hit apply again and I can switch between the libraries. And you may find yourself doing this. Eventually you'll find specific molds that you really like. Um, and then you'll typically, you know, just use a few different ones, one typically for each shape. So this one's a little bit better. Um, some libraries are set in really nice um, occlusal anatomy and alignment. So you can see that this one is a balanced occlusion library. So all the teeth are already set in occlusion. And there's really not a whole lot that I need to do here. Um, I need to check my original tooth positions. I would use this as a way to also see if the mold that I choose is the right shape and size. So if it wasn't, I can choose a different shape. And you can still see the molds pictured down here. So I can keep going through here to try to find one that is a better fit for the patient.
So maybe I like this one a little bit better. And really it's, it's a personal preference, a little bit of mold shape and size, depending on what you want to choose. So I'm going to go with this one here. So I like this one a little bit better. So now I'm going to use the wax rim here to position these teeth. And I'll minimize this box at the bottom. And so I can use my different tools here to position these teeth. Most of the tools in this step will keep the arch form um, in, as one piece. This is handy because it, it makes the, um, the teeth stay in occlusion so you don't have to constantly worry about um, them coming out of occlusion or being the occlusion being modified. Um, so I'll go through here and I'm going to uh, position these teeth with this tool. And then I'll move on to the next tool, which allows me to change the arch form. So if I grab from the upper canine here, I can widen out my arches. And then when I release, it will snap everything back into contact with each other. So um, I'm starting to be able to uh, get my teeth in the proper occlusion. And I can move back and forth between tools. So if I notice that maybe uh, maybe my proportions are slightly off. So I can see that my posterior isn't following. I can bring, I can enlarge these back so that they're a little bit bigger in the posterior. Um, that's one of the advantages of designing your own teeth. I can make uh, minor changes to the teeth, positions, um, rotate teeth if I need to. reposition things and adjust the overall um, occlusion if I want. So that looks pretty good from this tool. So I'm gonna move into this tool. I'll turn off my upper arch. I'll turn on my lower arch. And now I can see from above where my teeth are in relationship to the ridges. So this is pounds triangle here. So I need to swing my posterior segments out. So I can go ahead and do that. I can either lock them in symmetrically. So when I move one side, it moves both, or I can turn off symmetric and I can move one side at a time. All the while so far, everything has stayed in occlusion. Specifically, the posterior is still in its balanced occlusion. Once I move into uh, these last two tools here, that does move things into a um, no longer in occlusion. So you'll notice I can turn on symmetric design here with the single tooth tool, and I can make adjustments to both sides so that they stay symmetrical. And then I can right click and use the tools to bring things into contact properly. I can also, um, if I wanted to get rid of, maybe I don't want these last molars here, I can right click on one of them, remove all second molars, and that just deletes the second molars off of the case. I can also do this with the second premolars. If I do that, it will remove the second premolars and slide all the molars forward into contact with the first bicuspids. So you can see that here. As I make movement changes on one side with the symmetric design turned on, you'll see that it allows me to make those changes with both sides. And then I can um, make any adjustments that I need to individually as well by turning off symmetric design. So if I want to turn it off, I can turn it off and then I can make individual movements. If I want to see an occlusal map that shows me what my contacts look like, I can turn on the slider here on the right and that will show me what those contacts look like. Now I can turn off one arch of teeth and I can take a look and see 
what my contacts all look like. What I want to avoid are spots that look bluish like this. Those are going to be areas where I have a slight over penetration through the adjacent teeth. I can avoid that um, later on. So I'm not going to really worry about that too much here. I am going to turn on my virtual articulator though and check for interferences. So the first thing I'll do is uh, turn on this um, virtual articulator here and I will align my arch in the virtual articulator. Then I'll go ahead and uh, turn on the virtual articulator and run it. So you'll see it'll function through and show me where I have any kinds of interferences with blue markings here on the teeth. So you can see that the centrals and the one canine are holding things up. So if I wanted to, I could come here with my tools, turn on symmetric design and go ahead and adjust up my central slightly. Adjust up my canines a little bit. And if I rerun the virtual articulator, you can see now I'm getting balancing around the all except for my one canine here. So maybe I'll drop this one down a little bit. And rerun it. And I can use this as a way to show me if I'm gonna get contact all the way around or not. So now I do have contact on all the teeth. So I'm gonna go next. Um, and move through the base design. So I've got my border on my my um, my arch already designed um, and set. So now I can see where it is in relationship to the teeth. And then if I want, I can choose different aesthetic options here um, for my denture base. So there is a default delicate, uh, natural, and intense. Um, and then you can adjust each one. So each one has deep, different default sliders that you'll see when you select, select through these. I'll just choose the uh, natural and then hit the preview button and then you'll be able to see what it looks like. Oh, um, if you're not going to mill, then you'll want drill compensation turned off. You can also set your base thickness here. So your manufacturer will tell you typically, or your material provider will tell you what that base thickness should be. Um, and then you can just enter that in there and that will give you that base thickness as a, as a minimum thickness for the rest of the design. Once your upper base generates, um, it will show you what it looks like. You'll notice that the teeth have these green lines around them towards the necks of the teeth. Those are what the manufacturer of the teeth have designated as the gingiva margins. So that's where the gingiva is gonna to generate to. Uh, it's not set in stone. So there is a sculpt step later on where we can adjust that and bring up more gingiva if we need to. So you can see this is the gingiva that it generated for me. So if I turn off my scan, we can see it uh, very clearly here. So I'll go next and go ahead and do the lower. And go next again, and that will generate out the lower gingiva. Once our gingiva base generates, then it will get bring us into our finalized step. And in the finalized step, we can actually go through here and start the uh, prep, preparing it for the manufacturing process. So the very first step it's gonna bring us into, it'll start us with the upper and we're gonna do the connectors in between the teeth. Since I am manufacturing these teeth, um, it will bring in a connector in between so that I can have them all bridged together instead of having to loot in 
each tooth individually. This is controlled by two factors. The first is how the order form is set up. Um, so if you don't bridge the teeth, then you will get individual files for each teeth. But there is a limiting factor to that, which is controlled by the, the tooth library that you choose. Some libraries do not allow you to not bridge the teeth together. So um, you would want to make sure with the whatever library you're going to use that they do allow you to um, not bridge the teeth together. So here um, I'm going to do the connectors. So I'm going to turn off the gingiva so that you can see what the connectors look like and hit the preview button. Excuse me, Brandon, we did have a question and I wanted to make sure I answered it accurately. Sure. Um, the question was, what design software is this, which I answered three shape, but does it have a, a specific name besides just three shape? Yeah, so this is dental system. This is our laboratory software. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So you can see here that it generated these connectors in between the teeth. Um, on the anterior, it does try to bring them as far down as it can. The connectors do need to be a certain size, so you can't completely bring them down below the tissue. But for the most part, you can bring the papillas up to the tops of these connectors here um, and hide them for the most part. Um, you can also, after these are manufactured, before you loop them in, you can take a disc in between and clean these areas out a little bit. So I'll go next here. This will take me to my sculpt anatomy step. And in this step, I can go back into the virtual articulator now. And I can actually not just see what the uh, function looks like on the teeth and then have to move the individual teeth, but now I can uh, equilibrate these denture teeth. So I can actually use the adapt design feature and it will actually grind in slightly the areas that have uh, the blue marking and it kind of equilibrate the denture teeth together. So in order to do that, what I'll do is I will come here to the cut contacts and I will set this at whatever value I want to set it at. So um, I usually go about 0.2 to start and then I'll go ahead and play the articulator so you can see this. So I have all these blue markings here, <coughs> uh, and these signify different uh, functions that are done on the teeth. I can go ahead and once this finishes, hit the adapt design button here in the virtual articulator box. And then what you'll see, so if I zoom in here on these uh, anterior teeth and hit the adapt design button, you'll see that the software slightly adjusts those areas down so that I can modify the function slightly. So now that I've done that, you can see across the whole denture uh, teeth, I'm now getting better function, better balancing occlusion here. Not only does it do the upper, which is what I'm on, but it also adjusts the lowers too. So when I look at the upper and lower teeth together, I can see that they're both kind of equilibrated and you'll see if you over adjust, you might see some, some weird shapes in your anterior teeth. Um, but as long as you don't do that adapt too many times, um, you won't get too many weird occlusal schemes here. Um, you also don't want to do this too much because it, it has the same effect that it would if you were doing this in analog, where if you over adjust, your vertical pin will drop on your articulator and you'll actually have um, an open bite to where it, it, it'll cause the patient to overclose slightly. So I usually only do this once um, and then move forward. That typically is enough to equilibrate the dentures pretty well together. So I'm going to close out of this and go ahead and move next. This next step is for sculpting my denture base. So I can come in here and I can add some material to these papilla areas to kind of close up these spaces. So you can see I can sculpt these papillas up to cover up those connector areas. I can also fix any folds that may have occurred 
um, when it generated the border. So if I wanted to do that, I could use my smoothing tool here around the border and come in here and just smooth these areas out so that I have a better transition to my border um, than what I had before. And then I can fill in this uh, valley that it gave me in between where the roots come together. So I can fill a lot of this in as well so that I don't get that weird groove going across the denture. And it's a little more friendly for polishing. And then I also want to check my lingual surfaces as well. Um, if you don't clean up some of these areas in here, or you could get some weird shapes back here um, as far as what, how it generates the pockets and the way that the gingiva looks on the lingual. And again, you have to polish these dentures once you've glued everything together as far as the teeth and the base. So you want to make sure that you, uh, you don't create any weird crevices back here um, that'll cause hard to reach areas or hard to polish areas. And then you can smooth these areas out. Make sure everything is nice and smooth. So again, you can make this a little friendlier for polishing. Brandon, we had another question pop in and that was um, whether connectors are needed between teeth. Um, it depends on the manufacturing process that you're gonna use. Um, if you're doing a, um, base with design teeth, which is where you're manufacturing the teeth and the base. Um, it's recommended to do connectors because it's harder to loot each individual teeth, tooth into the base without them. Um, it also, um, some denture tooth libraries will not allow you to not bridge the teeth together. Um, Ivoclar is one of them. Um, Dent Supply is another. Um, there's a few others out there that won't allow you to do that. Um, so it, it just depends on what teeth libraries you're going to use and what uh, manufacturing process you're going to use. So if you wanted to replicate an existing diastema, let, let's say, would you do that as, as part of the finishing process and physically open that? No. So what you would do, uh, you don't have to bridge everything into one big bridge. So if it was a diastema in the centrals, you would bridge the left half of the arch in one bridge and the other half in another bridge so that you can leave a gap between the centrals. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Some other things you can do here, you can add stippling to the denture base. We do have some denture patterns in here. Um, so if I go ahead and apply it, I have to add where I want that to go. So I can specifically tell the software I want stippling, maybe just here on the buckle surfaces of the gingiva, maybe not in the palate. And when I do that, I just highlight the areas I want in red, and then I can go ahead and apply it. Once I apply it, you'll see that it puts the stippling in just the area where the red. So you can see that there. And there are different stippling patterns. This isn't one that you have to use. This is one of the new ones that's generated for dentures specifically. We do have some partial patterns in there um, that you can use as well. And then when I go next um, from the sculpt step, um, it's the coupling mechanism here. So when you're manufacturing your own teeth, you have to set the path of insertion of those teeth into the denture base. So similar to our model builder software, you wanna make sure that you don't see any of these purple areas showing through like I do in between the centrals. So if I do, I can adjust the path with this control point 
and try to get it to where I don't show any of those purple spots. Sometimes you can adjust it to where it won't show. Sometimes you have to go back and sculpt more material into those areas to get that to not show through. So once it generates uh, the coupling mechanism here, um, it will show, it, it will actually change the bottoms of the teeth to make them a little bit more passive to fit down into the denture base. So you can see that here, all the bottoms of the teeth were adjusted in the bridge. And then on this step here, um, now what we're going to do is the opposite. So we're actually going to generate the pockets into the denture base. So when I hit next here, it will calculate out and generate the pockets based on a few factors there. One being the glue spacer, which is the space for the bonding agent in the denture. The other is the minimum thickness under the teeth. So it tries to maintain based on that um, value that's set in there, a minimum thickness from the intaglio surface to the bottom of the pocket for the teeth so that it doesn't make the denture too weak in those areas because that's that's a load bearing area um, and if it, you put too much pressure in there and the material is too thin it could cause a crack or a break in the denture so you want to make sure that um, whatever material you're going to use to manufacture these um, you know what that minimum thickness is underneath the pocket so that you don't generate that with too small of a space Brandon, are you able to utilize the software um, for gingival surgery guides? Like if you have, uh, they gave the example of crown lengthening. Yeah, so we have um, not in the denture software specifically, but in our dental system software, you can um, design a, what we call a, um, a temporary ponic workflow. So basically what it does is it extracts the patient's existing teeth gives you gingiva sites. And what you'll do is you'll sculpt those gingiva sites into the size or the length that you want their new gingiva to be. Then you'll design um, the, the denture uh, or the, the teeth that fit to that. So you can make a nice diagnostic wax up of that. And then you can even take it a step further and you can use um, our copy and append feature, which basically takes that design, appends it to the model and you can take it into our custom tray workflow and actually design, design like a gingivectomy guide. So you can cut back the gingiva. Uh, one additional question on the design software. It, it does not come as your basic software with Trios, correct? That's an additional purchase? No, it does not. Our, our TRIO software is our clinical scanning software, so it's going to be yep. different from this. This is our laboratory design software. But dental practices also use this on occasion as well. The yeah, any, any, anyone can purchase it, whether it be a lab yep. or a dental practice, yeah. Got it. Um, one other thing that's new to this version of our software is we now allow for the placement of ID tags. Um, so that will engrave in there a or create a raised um, text on there. So if you want it to be engraved, you would just take this down to a negative value. That's going to engrave that in there. And then what I recommend is if you are going to engrave the text in there, you can use like a uh, like a dark tooth composite stain or something along that lines fill that in and then go over it with clear acrylic and that will capture that um, material in there. So I'm just gonna go next through these steps. Um, the very last step after these two steps is just the saving and closing out and then generating the cam. So one of the nice things about our software with the cam outputs is that even though I made this as a, um, denture um, with design teeth and base, I can actually um, set this up to have a uh, 
monoblock output as well. So it will give me, try to adjust this a little bit. I'm gonna have to go back there and sculpt that little spot. So I will actually get my monoblock output for this case, which will allow me to use that as like my try indenture so I can check fit, um, vertical, occlusion, aesthetics. And by printing that in a try-in material or milling it in a try-in material, it's significantly cheaper than printing it or milling it in the final materials. Um, I can still check the aesthetics and use it similar to like a wax rim or a tri indenture. Um, the only disadvantage to it is you cannot just move the teeth around on it, on it physically when you have it in the patient's mouth. The advantage to it though, is that I, I have uh, seen some clinics that print it in a material that's a little stronger and they will allow the patient to leave the office wearing it for you know the two weeks or however long it takes for them to manufacture the final. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll come back and let the doctor know, did they like the shape, size, maybe shade or fit, see if there was any issues with it. And if there weren't, then they'll give them their final dentures and then they're ready to go. So you can technically do this in a three to four appointment visit, um, depending on how many try-ins you have to do. If it's just one try-in, then you can do it in a three appointment visit. Um, workflow if you need to do it uh, multiple try-ins that can obviously extend it out. Brandon, there's a question about the design software but specific to um, crowns and that is confirming if you're able to adjust the thickness of crowns like you can adjust the thickness of the denture. Yes, yeah so um, our crown and bridge software will give you a uh, default minimum thickness based on whatever the material is set for, uh, but you can adjust that. So if you need to make it thinner, you can do that. You just have to make sure that you know that that could affect the longevity of that restoration. You can obviously make it thicker with no issues, but yes, you have complete control over the way it looks, how thick it is, how thin it is, um, cutting contacts, your occlusion, all that kind of stuff you have complete control over. So you can see here, it finished out my design. It's in the process of saving it right now. Under my order elements area, once I get my green checks there, that means it saved everything, with no issue. If I have any red checks, it didn't save something, so I may need to go back and fix um, whatever, wherever that is. But you can see here, I got all green, so I'll hit the close button up at the top left. And then that will save and close out of my case, change the status over to design. And then I can go and find my STL outputs and manufacture those. So here's my case here. Go down to advanced and explore the cam. And then here's all of my STL files. So you can see I've got my monoblock here for my upper and lower. So I can go ahead and print these as try-ins. And then I've also got my bases and my two bridges of teeth. So all of those files automatically generated um, in this case is ready to be manufactured. Well, that, that pretty much concludes that workflow. Um, if there's any questions or anything later on that comes up, um, you can always reach out to me. Actually, one just popped through, and that was uh, specific to implants. Could the software calculate gingival thickness? Um, I mean, to a degree. So if you're talking about gingival thickness around like an implant site, as far as the emergence profile area, yes, you can measure that. Um, but anything below that from 
you're talking about using like a CBCT scan and overlaying your surface scan and then measuring. Um, the dental system software doesn't accept CBCT scans unless okay. you can convert them to like an STL. Okay. And then there's another one, how to make designs into real dentures. Oh, through digital printing. So printing or milling, yes. Yeah. 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 So that file, those files that I just showed, uh, um, those would be what you would take to your 3D printer um, or your mill, depending on what you're using to manufacture. So you can see when I start to open these, um, these are all of my individual files. So I'm going to turn some of these off just to show. So you can see here's one of my bridges of teeth. So this is ready to be manufactured. My other bridge of teeth. Then I've got, that's a monoblock. There's a base that goes with the teeth. So you can see it's just the gingiva base. And then I've got my other gingiva base is right here. So these are all manufacturable files. These are STLs. Got it. Hey, Brandon, this is Dennis. Um, I had a question for you. By the way, great presentation. Um, I love where we're going with uh, uh, denture technology. I've been doing dentures for over 40 years, and uh, I know this is an evolving technology. Uh, but um, you know, as, as far as um, uh, the comfort level with uh, clinicians between printed and milled, what do you find out is more prevalent? Yeah, as, far as. Um, as far as what I'm seeing now, um, printing is really gaining leaps and bounds over the others, um, specifically like the, the traditionally processed and the milled. Um, what you'll find is that, yes, the printed are weaker than uh, both of the other types, but when you look at the cost to manufacture them, um, there's printers out there where you can do a full upper and lower denture um, for material costs alone. It's around 20 bucks. Yeah. So if it breaks in a couple years, you can just, you have the, the files still, you can just reprint them and then give them the exact same dentures back. Um, milling is significantly more expensive than both, uh, but it is a lot stronger than both. Um, mm -hmm. It's stronger than traditional just because you don't have to worry about porosity in the dentures. Um, so it's a solid material through and through, and it's typically still an acrylic. Uh, it's right. just a milled acrylic instead of a processed acrylic. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hearing more and more uh, technicians leaving out the post dam, especially on, on milled dentures because they fit so well. Yeah, yeah I, I've had some um, customers that have told me that they've had issues with putting the post dams in because the patients cannot get the dentures out. Right. Wow. Something. Amazing. Yeah, that's amazing, actually. Yeah, very good. And so, Brandon, we want to thank you so much for your time, um, attention, and education that you presented. And any closing remarks, Dennis, Kelly, uh, or Brandon? Yeah, I just want to thank Brandon for a great presentation. I love seeing this technology. And we've come so far in the last few years with this technology and, uh, and we're getting better and better with it. So, uh, you know, as someone, as a technician who used to process 30 to 40 dentures a day in the laboratory, you know, the traditional way to see this technology, I'm, I'm excited about it. So it's great yeah. to come a long way. So I just want to you know, thank everybody for joining us. And uh, again, if you have any questions, you can always email uh, Brandon or, or myself and we'll get back to you with some answers. But thank you so much for joining us.